Franklin Delano Roosevelt had created a new paradigm in the United States. Following his unprecedented four elections to office, his New Deal coalition continued to hold on to power and shaped a post-war country defined by an economically interventionist government, a government which increasingly emphasized the preeminence of urban centers and the political machines which FDR established within them. This would be an early inception point for the later rural-urban divide which would emerge in the country. However, initially the New Deal coalition would be able to maintain overwhelming support from rural labor centers, namely regions of the country with high potential for resource extraction such as Appalachia, the Rockies, the Colorado Plateau, and the Great Basin. New Dealers were also able to rely upon the support of the largely agricultural southeastern states, the loyally democratic though socially conservative Solid South, having remained defiant to the Republican Party which defeated them in the Civil War. Despite the order FDR had established, the country would be on course to transform demographically, with the emergence of the suburbs soon shifting a large segment of FDR's reliable pro-New Deal population out of urban centers, all the while the Second Great Migration saw a mass transplanting of the southern black population to northern and western cities to the point that by the end of the 1960s, nearly 80% of America's black population lived in urban areas nationwide. Consequently, the white flight that would follow would drive greater numbers of white city dwellers to move to the suburbs, leaving nearly half of the total national population to call the suburbs home by that point in time. Cities weren't the only part of the country that was changing either. For decades, rural America had slowly been hollowing out, something which we might attribute to the mass development and urbanization brought to the country by the first wave of Republican presidents. Of course, prior to the Republican era, the nation had been dominated by its agricultural South, and ever since then, agriculture had played an increasingly diminishing role in the lives of the average American, with innovative tools and machinery allowing farmers to produce increasing quantities of crop with a fraction of the manpower, driving many who could no longer find work in rural communities to seek better opportunities in their nearest cities, which of course shrunk the size of the average rural community, but still kept many somewhat prosperous, albeit simpler than their urban counterparts. This effect would be compounded by the crop failures of the Dust Bowl and further technological innovations throughout the decades, and while initially the mid-20th century would still see a majority of rural communities in good health, toward the end of the century the continued loss of population and business would create a cascading effect that led many rural towns to become unsustainable, eventually producing one in the modern day known as rural ghettos, or more colloquially as the boondocks, backwoods, or the sticks. All of this paired with a transformation of national political ideology and what would become a massive rise in immigration following the 1965 Hart Seller Immigration Act would significantly shake up the political dynamics and electoral landscape of the country as the years wore on. The United States was now a power which played a major role in foreign politics. Standing as one of the two post-war superpowers, it took on the responsibilities of rebuilding Europe in the aftermath of the Second Great War and began carving out a sphere of influence for itself, whilst attempting to limit the sphere of its rival, the Soviet Union. Domestically on a high following victory in the war and experiencing an economic resurgence in the wake of the Great Depression, the country also turned its attention away from alleviating issues of need to more social issues of the day affecting particular groups. This meant increased emphasis upon civil rights, union rights, care for the poor, and generally attempting to lift up groups seen as disadvantaged. But idealism perhaps led the country to reach beyond its means, as reforms and foreign actions were met with increased criticism from the public. The last years of New Dealer Lyndon Baines Johnson's presidency demonstrated a rising desire for change among the citizenry, and made clear the divisions within the New Deal coalition along liberal, conservative, and labor lines. As a result of this, anti-New Dealers within the Republican Party were able to take advantage of these circumstances to propel former President Eisenhower's Vice President Richard Nixon into the White House on a platform that highlighted reducing New Deal-era social welfare deemed unnecessary in a post-oppression nation, promoting law and order in the wake of years of anti-war and race-based rioting, as well as taking a firmer stance against communism while toning down foreign interventionism, particularly in regard to Asia, something Nixon had opposed since his time as a senator during the Truman administration. Nixon rallied disenchanted Southern conservatives who felt that the Democratic Party had become the party of civil rights and who had, in an unprecedented fashion, turned out for Republican candidate Barry Goldwater in the previous election on account of his opposing the Civil Rights Act on grounds of constitutionality and overstepping of federal power. Nixon, however, was not opposed to civil rights or even a militant anti-communist. Nixon was a nuanced and moderate figure whose comparably common-sense approach to policy earned him favor across the political spectrum from individuals who simply wanted a solution to the various new troubles facing the country and those old issues which the New Deal coalition had swept aside for years to focus on the faction's agenda. Nixon's appeal to what he popularly called the silent majority would win him a landslide re-election in 1972 as well, carrying all but one state, and laying the foundation for America's next great change. Though of course while he laid the groundwork for it, he would not be the man to launch this era entirely finding himself compelled to step down from office following a national scandal which ruined his credibility and halted the country's political transformation. 
Domestically, Nixon had sought to roll back what he saw as the overreaching of federal authority and high government spending instituted by the New Deal coalition. His vision for this was known as New Federalism, which, contrary to the original brand of American federalism, sought decentralization of government power to the states, most notably through his policy of revenue sharing, which distributed federal funds to the various state governments to use as they saw fit. Facing resistance to these policies from congressional New Dealers, Nixon redirected his attention to alleviating economic woes in a time of inflation brought on by New Deal policies and the expense of war in Vietnam. Despite attempts to reduce government spending, Nixon found himself unable to combat inflation and ultimately suspended the gold standard, allowing the government to control the money supply and for the moment produce a temporary solution to the high government spending. But in the long term, this created an unprecedented level of inflation which would continue well until the 21st century, along with a rising level of national debt as the combination of Keynesian-style spending, globalization of the economy, and dropping of the gold standard all but abandoned any sense of a baseline for the economy setting the stage for a new economic age of American history. Despite Southern conservative impressions that Nixon's talk of law and order and states' rights were merely euphemisms for opposing civil rights policies, a trend of belief that would continue among Southern and rural conservative voters, Nixon would continue to pursue integration policies moderately, not enforcing them aggressively but carrying them through when and where it was constitutional. One of Nixon's most noteworthy of such policies was the Philadelphia Plan, a system that required government contractors in Philadelphia to meet certain racial hiring quotas, and which was later expanded to other cities. This was part of a larger vision of Nixon's that he called Black Capitalism, a means of enabling the African American population to acquire valuable work and business skills to succeed in the American economy. This too would carry on throughout the era with Black employment or Black economic conditions becoming a staple talking point for both parties. Nixon's administration would also see to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in response to a growing desire for environmental conservation, a matter which would become increasingly prevalent among later administrations, especially upon the end of the Cold War. Nixon would oversee the success of the moon landing in 1969, but can follow up plans for a moon base and Mars mission to further cut back on government spending. Nixon would also launch what became known as the War on Drugs, tackling this new moral dilemma which appeared to be rising with both the free drug use of the counterculture movement and with veterans returning from overseas addicted to drugs, typically narcotics and marijuana, which were used by the soldiers during the war to alleviate pain and stress. Drug use would fluctuate but generally continue to rise over the next several years with greater quantities and varieties of drugs arriving in the US from Latin America as immigration from these countries rose and as pharmaceutical companies normalized the use of opioids in later decades as painkillers without consideration for their addictive properties. The war on drugs would become a defining staple of this era and a recurring issue tackled by nearly every administration that followed with some drugs such as marijuana and certain hallucinogenics becoming tolerated, whilst opioids and methamphetamine remain widespread on account of their addictiveness, despite the stigma and hazards surrounding them. In foreign policy, Nixon was aided by a man who would become one of the most influential political advisors of this era, a chief architect of the then-emerging neoconservative geopolitical strategy, Henry Kissinger. Together, Nixon and Kissinger worked together to reach peace in Vietnam, court communist China as a means of isolating the Soviet Union without the use of force, prop up Israel as a powerful ally in the pro-Soviet Middle East, and quietly prevent the rise of pro-communist governments within North and South America through the tactical use of the Central Intelligence Agency. The name of Kissinger's game was détente, to defuse tensions strategically before they led to larger, more costly conflicts, and for the most part, this policy had proven highly effective, becoming a consistent staple of the administrations of this era until the end of the Cold War. Nixon's ultimate goal was to avoid direct war for the United States, provide financial support to allies, and promote peace whenever possible, including attempting to normalize relations between the US and USSR. While his overall success in guiding the country toward long-term security is questionable, he had undoubtedly opened the door to a new future, but once again he would not be able to follow through on his final goals. Nixon had a very mixed relationship with the increasingly prevalent intelligence sector of the government. He believed that left-wing operatives within the CIA in particular were conspiring against his administration and the country by leaking information to news sources, rival politicians, and potentially foreign actors. In response to this, Nixon created what became known as the White House Plumbers to stop these leaks until he could restructure the CIA and transfer management of its covert operations to a new agency under the Director of National Intelligence. It would be these plumbers who, without Nixon's authorization, broke into the Watergate building and initiated the scandal that would ultimately force Nixon to resign after he attempted to hide his administration's connection to the plumbers. What followed were probes into the intelligence agency's actions over several years, uncovering an assortment of off-color operations, some of which were leaked to the public at the time, others of which remained confidential until several years later. With Nixon out of office and his vice president having already stepped down previously due to another scandal, power fell to Gerald Ford, 
the first man to assume the office of the presidency without being elected either president or vice president, having served as House Minority Leader prior to his appointment to the vice presidency. Ford ran a lukewarm administration that largely sought to restore the reputation of the Republican Party. However, the damage had been done, and in the subsequent midterm election, the Democrats had utterly defeated the Republicans, strengthening their hold over both houses of Congress and preventing Ford from vetoing several congressional decisions. Of the policies which Ford was able to pass through against the resistance of Congress, most led to lackluster results. Henry Kissinger during this time would continue as a close advisor, working with Ford to continue pursuing a normalization of relations with China and the USSR, and to maintain a powerful Western bloc secure from rival forces. However, it was becoming increasingly clear to many that the Near East was becoming a major theater of interest for the country, between tensions arising among Greece and Turkey which threatened the security of NATO, to rising hostilities between the Arabs and Israelis, which prompted Ford to consider withdrawing support from Israel, only to be refused by some 76 of Congress's 100 senators. The Ford presidency achieved little outside of continuing detente policies and perhaps most remarkably expanding the Federal Election Campaign Act passed under Nixon to regulate campaign spending. Ford would ultimately be defeated in his bid for a second term by Southern Liberal Democrat Jimmy Carter, whose distinctive views led him to clash with both Northern Liberals and Southern Conservatives, all the while his highly lukewarm approach to policy and inability to maneuver DC politics left many to view him as ineffective, idealistic, and weak. Since Nixon's resignation, crisis of confidence had been the phrase haunting the presidency, and Carter would not help to dispel it. Carter in great part owed his rise to power to his status as a Washington outsider, his moderate reputation, and his favorable media coverage, the latter of which propelled him from a relatively obscure figure to the choice Democrat candidate, and eventually the president-elect. However, his administration would be rocked by an energy crisis, economic stagflation, and international troubles. The costs of the Vietnam War, the 1973 energy crisis, and the abolition of the gold standard, among other issues, had left the country in a recession that lasted from the late Nixon administration to the mid-Ford administration, and the lingering effects of which carried on into Carter's administration, with recovery being repeatedly halted and impeded. The energy crisis was largely brought on by conflict and instability within the Middle East, and particularly Middle Eastern animosity toward the United States, something which was only further fueled by Nixon's doctrine of foreign policy in the region a doctrine which pledged not direct intervention but support for regional allies against their enemies, in particular this meant the American allies of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and for a time, Iran. During Nixon's time, this saw an alliance of oil-producing Arab nations refuse to conduct business with the United States, enacting an oil embargo that spawned the oil crisis of 73. The effects of that embargo would linger and during Carter's time, the continued destabilization of the region in the aftermath of the Islamic Revolution in Iran would further cut into America's oil supplies and send economic recovery into a tailspin. The Islamic Revolution would continue to impact Carter with what many argue was his greatest folly, his handling of a hostage crisis which saw 66 Americans taken captive in Iran. Carter's attempts to liberate these hostages would result in the death of eight soldiers, ultimately forcing him to compromise with the new Iranian regime. Despite these issues, Carter would attempt to pursue his liberal agenda, one which entailed expanding the welfare system, furthering the promotion of civil rights by bringing attention to issues concerning the LGBT community and women, seeking to enact affirmative action policies and decriminalizing cannabis, all of which produced mixed results at the time, but which would go on to become mainstays of the Democrat Party. Abroad, Carter sought to shift focus away from using American might to challenge communism, and instead turned toward using American wealth and resources to promote humanitarianism and cooperation. In line with Nixon's policy of detente, relations between the U.S. and People's Republic of China would be strengthened at the expense of Taiwan, with the U.S. beginning a general reduction of its military presence across East Asia, as well as in Latin America, terminating support for strong anti-communist Latin American allies which Carter viewed as being in violation of democratic and liberal values. South Africa and Rhodesia would also come under greater scrutiny for what Carter called discriminatory and anti-democratic policies, though the authoritarian native African-run regime of Zaire continued to receive support during this period. Beyond this, the Panama Canal would officially begin a process of being ceded to the Republic of Panama, and Carter would welcome over 100,000 Cuban refugees into the country during the Mariel boat lift. Carter's soft-handed approach to foreign policy and emphasis on light detente would come into heavy question with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. This paired with a crisis in Iran, a stagnant economy, and ineffectual domestic policy would cost him re-election. Though that being said, just as Nixon had laid the foundations for a new Republican Party, so would Carter's administration foreshadow a new solidifying faction of the Democrat Party. Finally, the chaos and uncertainty of this era was brought to an end under the leadership of a man who exemplified the vision which men like Goldwater, Nixon, and Kissinger had been building. The Cold War had transformed the United States. No longer was it a regional power sheltered behind its own borders. It was a superpower which sought global influence, a global presence, a global economy. America had received the natural successor to the foreign policy begun under men like Theodore Roosevelt and FDR, while breaking with the economically pro-labor positions traditionally associated with them. 
amalgamating this pro-globalist foreign policy with a domestic policy that appealed to both rural conservatives and the business interests of the North and West. This was the beginning of the Reagan administration. Having begun his public life as an actor in 1966, Reagan would seek the California governorship, beating out his opponent, incumbent Governor Pat Brown, by capitalizing on his own star power and his opponent's shortcomings as governor. Earlier in his life, Ronald Reagan had aligned himself with the New Dealer branch of the Democrat Party, idolizing FDR and demonstrating remarkably socially liberal views for his time. However, his experience in the military and as an actor working in Hollywood had soured him on the idea of large-scale bureaucracy, welfare systems, and communism, the latter of which he felt was widespread in Hollywood, and posed a legitimate threat to American security, sowing the seeds for his anti-communist, anti-economic interventionist, and anti-labor views, and thus he joined the Republican Party. As governor, Reagan would pursue policies which would continue to remain dominant issues nationwide for decades to come. He would oversee an effort to balance the budget, cut welfare policies to encourage self-sufficiency, and reduce taxes. In 1967, he would sign into effect the Therapeutic Abortion Act, decriminalizing medical abortions under certain circumstances, and would see to the passing of California's most restrictive gun control law of the day that same year via the Mulford Act, seeing it as necessary to maintaining law and order by preventing radical groups from carrying firearms in public. Reagan would also take significant action to reform the criminal justice system as well, but despite this, would see robberies and homicides rise during his governorship. In addition to this, in 1969, he would pass the country's first no-fault divorce law, making divorce a far easier process to initiate by either spouse, setting a standard for several other states to follow. Reagan's political positions, actions, and goals during his governorship, in contrast to what many recognize as his more conservative presidential administration, reveal a man who was genuinely inexperienced, or at least for a time, disinterested in domestic social issues, preferring instead to focus more on economic matters and later upon foreign policy. Naturally, Reagan had demonstrated tolerance and even support in his early years for racial equality, LGBT rights, and feminism, but as his anti-communist and small government views developed, he would find himself inclined to embrace more conservative positions, at least publicly. Immediately following his time as governor, Reagan would pursue the presidential nomination, and despite early shortcomings, finally succeeded in securing the presidential office in 1980, much in the same fashion by which he won his governorship, by capitalizing upon his own celebrity and emphasizing the failures of his opponent. Though that being said, Reagan would come to power with a definitive platform that achieved wide appeal, a platform that was best simplified by the phrase small government and strong defense. Southerners flocked to Reagan's stance on states' rights and law and order, once again interpreting this as a euphemism for anti-civil rights policies despite Reagan's pro-tolerance track record. Both Northeastern liberals and Southern conservatives clung to Reagan's anti-communism and desire for increased foreign intervention and free trade. The business class adored Reagan's laissez-faire approach to regulation and economics. All the while, rural evangelicals felt represented by Reagan's identification with traditional Christian values, his image as a Christian leader being bolstered by evangelical groups like the Moral Majority. In a matter of time, Reagan was able to frame to the public America's struggle against Russia as a struggle between Christendom and godlessness, essentially politicizing moral issues in the scheme of Cold War politics, something which truly had not been capitalized upon in such a way since the Eisenhower administration, if even that. Consequently, Reagan's platform and positions across his two terms would create a final realignment of voters, driving pro-labor, social liberal, secular, and minority-focused factions more thoroughly to the Democrat Party, whilst redefining the Republican Party into the party of free trade, big business, states' rights, and Christian values. Reagan was able to appeal to rural America through his Christian and small government talking points while finding a new base of support in middle-class suburban America, who were disenchanted with the liberal and labor policies of past presidents and swayed by Reagan's economic promises and talking points on family values. And while initially much of the country still stood divided in 1980, by the subsequent 1984 election, Reagan had shored up his support base and thoroughly completed the political realignment. Slowly, government involvement in the economy faded, with nearly half of all business regulations by this point being eradicated or curtailed. Funding for various New Deal and Great Society programs were cut, free trade was expanded, and income taxes were brought down. Thus came the rise of Reaganomics. Taxes were cut for the majority of Americans, but most especially the wealthy, while family incomes rose, and though Reagan would face repeated economic difficulties during his presidency, including a tripling of the national debt, many began to feel that the country was quickly recovering from its financial woes. Under Reagan, Dayton took a brief backseat to strong defense, military spending increased dramatically, new military technologies were explored, and funding to anti-communist movements across the globe increased without regard for long-term implications, largely being done under the oversight of the CIA and National Endowment for Democracy, something which would later wrap Reagan up in the Iran-Contra scandal. The foundations for what would later become the Patriot Act were also established via Reagan's Executive Order 12333 which outlined standards and practices for spying on both foreign figures and American citizens believed to be connected to hostile governments, terrorist groups, and drug trafficking. 
The early outline for what would eventually become NAFTA would also come into being thanks to Reagan's 1984 Trade and Tariff Act and the subsequent Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement. Since the signing of the Hart Seller Immigration Act, immigration had rapidly been on the rise in the United States, including illegal immigration. In an effort to curb the latter, Reagan would initiate a heightening of border security, criminalize the hiring of illegal immigrants, and grant amnesty to those presently within the country, some three million at the time. Without proper enforcement of illegal hiring laws and border security, however, Reagan's actions only had the inverse effect of encouraging more foreigners to enter the country illegally, recognizing a lack of enforcement and the possibility for additional amnesty bills in the future. This would lead to a massive influx of Central Americans to the southwestern states especially over the years, and the emergence of a significant Hispanic diaspora in the southwest which would largely come to favor the Democrat Party. Reagan would attempt to deliver on his evangelical policies by seeking a national abortion ban, promoting policies that upheld marriage and family values, and attempting to secure voluntary prayer in schools, but fell short of achieving any of these. What he did achieve was the establishment of Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a national holiday, which was favored by black Christians, he strengthened America's relationship with Israel, which was well received by evangelicals, and he intensified the war on drugs to combat a significant spike in drug use since the Nixon administration, once again tackling this as a moral and thus Christian issue. Beyond the direct effects of his policy, Reagan gave America a sense of security and hope once again. The crisis of confidence was seemingly over, and internationally America's enemies were feeling the pressure of an aggressive American war and intelligence machine. Cuba was kept at bay in Latin America, the Soviets were forced to retreat from Afghanistan and were now on the verge of collapse, and the new anti-Western forces of the Middle East were being suppressed. But Reagan's policies came with a double edge for the very people he intended to help. Rural Christian communities suffered a decrease in economic opportunity as the globalization of the American economy forced them to compete with foreign markets. For agricultural and resource-producing communities, this was nearly a death sentence, and once again rural America suffered a hollowing out of their population and finances. The destitution caused by this would ultimately allow the drug crisis to take root in rural areas across the country. Suburban communities, especially in America's industrial states, were also hit hard by economic globalization, with many industries offshoring their manufacturing to countries where labor was far cheaper, or shutting down entirely as they stood unable to compete with foreign counterparts. Much like agriculture, manufacturing now also began to shed excess labor as automation allowed companies to produce more with fewer employees, producing an outward appearance of financial health for the country as production and GDP appeared to increase, while internally many suffered income loss or outright job loss as a result of these policies. Beyond this, Reagan's small government approach had all but neutered any effective regional calls for mass reform, having intertwined the concept of small government with freedom and American conservatism, while the use of federal power became tainted as a slippery slope toward communism. The result of this would ultimately be a federal government which was domestically lethargic and ineffective, but highly proactive in foreign affairs, something which would later lead many Americans to feel as though the government no longer represented the American people. By 1988, Reagan had thoroughly changed the dynamic of the United States, and while this high would linger some time longer, especially following the fall of the USSR, the supposedly restored American dream was about to reveal itself to be nothing more than an illusion. In 1989, Reagan would be succeeded by his vice president and former director of the CIA, George H.W. Bush. Bush, like Reagan, was a strong believer in small government and foreign interventionism, placing a greater emphasis on foreign humanitarianism in a similar vein to Carter. He was of the persuasion that the totalitarian era was passing and that the United States would soon be the sole superpower and a model for the world over, shaping the nature of global policy to create a world he believed would be free, democratic, and mutually cooperative, and he believed it was America's responsibility to establish this new world order. Naturally, Bush's administration would be dominated by foreign policy. He would oversee the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, the fall of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany, and America's shoring up of control in various regions of the world, overthrowing the dictatorship of Panama and intervening against Iraq during their invasion of Kuwait. The Cold War had been won, and now the future belonged to the US to build. Of the few domestic issues tackled by the Bush administration, economics would likely take the largest share of focus, with Bush attempting to balance the budget and reduce the deficit left by Reagan through the cutting of domestic spending and raising of taxes. Beyond this, Bush would also take on social issues, signing into law the Americans with Disabilities Act and Civil Rights Act of 1991, the former of which extended civil rights protections to the disabled, while the latter of which allowed employees the right to sue for discrimination or harassment. Additionally, Bush would reform the Hart Seller Immigration Act in 1990 by expanding the total number of legal immigrants who could arrive in the U.S. each year, creating both new categories for work-based visas and the immigration lottery system to bring in immigrants from countries whose populations were deemed underrepresented in America, further establishing temporary protected status visas for individuals whose home countries were experiencing crisis. 
This would result in one of the largest spikes of immigration in American history, maintaining a continuous inflow nearly equal to that of the immigration wave experienced during the early 20th century, yet continuing over a longer span of time, possibly making it the beginning of the single largest immigration wave in all of American history. Bush's efforts to balance the national budget by raising taxes, as well as to a much lesser extent an unexpected third-party challenge from Ross Perot, whose platform ran contrary to the newly emerging establishment, would ultimately be what cost Bush a victory in the 1992 election, and allowed Southern Liberal Democrat Bill Clinton to take the presidency. Clinton would be to the Democrats what Reagan had been for the Republicans, a figure who would have the ideology and circumstances to shape a new future for their party in line with the dominant American ideology of the day, a globalist laissez-faire ideology. In this sense, Bill Clinton was the first true Democrat of this era, much as Reagan was the first true Republican of this era, with Nixon and Carter having merely been transitional steps from their New Deal counterparts. Clinton had inherited the post-Cold War high and had campaigned on what he called his third way, or what others have called triangulation. It was a platform that, like Reagan's neoconservatism, promised small government a balanced budget and personal freedom, but now placed a greater emphasis upon equality, environmentalism, and social welfare. Thus was born modern neoliberalism, Reagan-esque right-wing economics paired with left-wing social policy, and of course the overarching focus on global affairs. While Bush would be the first president to oversee the post-Cold War world, Clinton would be the first president to truly capitalize upon it. During his two terms of leadership, Clinton would simultaneously create a new era of good feelings, but also an age of domestic unrest among various populations who, now with the threat of the Cold War behind them, turned back toward internal circumstances and what increasingly seemed like a neglecting of domestic issues by the establishment. For many who grew up in the 2000s, it had been Clinton who defined the political character of what they would recognize as contemporary America. As despite his presidency having ended in 2001, Clinton-style neoliberalism would continue to dominate policy for at least the next decade. Under Clinton, America's global involvement would increase with the official signing of NAFTA, which created a free trade area between the US, Canada, and Mexico. China was granted most favored nation status by the United States, nearly doubling Chinese imports to the US in a five-year span of time, with massive increases in the years following, something which would deal a final killing blow to many remaining domestic American industries, which had already been declining gradually as the service-based economy emerged. Clinton had also guided China into joining the World Trade Organization, which Clinton had hoped would incentivize China to liberalize, but only dramatically increase the reach of the Chinese economy. It would be in this decade that the events of the Rodney King riots, Ruby Ridge standoff, Waco siege, and Oklahoma City bombings would take place, the former of which represented a new breaking point in national race relations with an increased focus upon law enforcement. The riots would leave the city of LA with over a billion dollars in property damage, seeing over 60 deaths and some 2,300 injuries. Unlike prior race riots which produced few direct gains for the black community, the Rodney King riots would lead to immediate concessions from the city of LA which awarded Rodney King a massive financial settlement and penalized its police department with calls for resignation and reform. The widespread news coverage of this riot and the results it had would inspire future responses to struggles with law enforcement from the black community. The latter events of Ruby Ridge and Waco would signal a crashing of American trust in federal authority, with government agents being implicated in the escalation of the two occurrences, which began as arrest attempts and resulted in the deaths of multiple innocents. The Oklahoma City bombing would occur as a direct response from Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, who became radicalized by the coverage of these events, coming to believe that the federal government was slowly stripping away the constitutional rights of its citizens. It would be during this same time that the American militia and constitutionalist movements began to grow in prominence, as would the prevalence of lone wolf domestic terrorists, further inspired by figures like the Unabomber and Eric Rudolph, who used terrorism to promote or advance their personal ideologies. In response to this and perceived threats from abroad, Clinton would enact policy aimed at studying and countering terrorist groups, both foreign and domestic, with it ultimately being concluded that most domestic militias posed little threat given their reactive nature, in comparison to foreign terrorist organizations which were proactive, actively plotting attacks such as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Later in the decade, the Columbine school shooting would begin an expanding of federal scrutiny to emotionally or mentally troubled youth, something which was seemingly growing in prevalence and which officials correctly guessed would result in additional similar shootings as years progressed, though officials have repeatedly failed to hone in on precise causes, which in turn resulted in multiple moral panics surrounding violent media. Clinton would continue in further Bush's spending cuts and tax raises in an effort to balance the budget, eventually succeeding in achieving a budget surplus in 1998, the first of its kind in decades. Clinton would also see to taking on more environmentalist endeavors, something which Bush had previously re-explored with his Clean Air Act and which Reagan had largely sidelined following Nixon and Carter's administrations. Where Clinton broke most significantly with his neoconservative counterparts was on social issues. 
Clinton would take up the cause of expanding rights for the LGBT community, allowing them to serve in the military under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell compromise as well as compromising on the Defense of Marriage Act, which, while regarded as having negatively impacted the LGBT community, was actually a strategic compromise which prevented the proposal and likely passing of a constitutional amendment which would have perpetually outlawed gay marriage nationwide, unlike the Defense of Marriage Act, which allowed for state flexibility and which Clinton believed would eventually be overturned. Clinton would also take action to secure access to abortions by revoking and vetoing policies which restricted the practice, along with passing the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. Foreign interventions would continue, particularly within the Balkans during the Yugoslav Wars, Clinton overseeing the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia while in the Middle East an effort to suppress terrorism and the rise of Al-Qaeda was underway. Clinton further sought to remove Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq, warning that he was a threat to global peace and a sponsor of global terrorism. This would lead to the passing of the Iraq Liberation Act of 1998, which outlined regime change as an American priority. In Eastern Europe, NATO was expanded and Russia under Boris Yeltsin was courted by Clinton toward democratization and liberalization, though tensions between the countries soon emerged. North Korea became a state of focus once it became suspected that the country was building a nuclear arsenal. Clinton would participate in peace talks between the UK and Ireland to bring an end to the troubles via the Good Friday Agreement. And of course, an American intervention in Somali would end in disaster when US helicopters were shot down in Mogadishu, leading to the death of 18 soldiers in the battle that followed. Clinton's reputation would ultimately be sullied by a sex scandal between himself and White House intern Monica Lewinsky, the fallout of which led to two articles of impeachment as he had denied the accusations leading to the charge that he had provided false testimony and was thus guilty of perjury and obstruction. However, Clinton would be acquitted and remain in office until 2001, being succeeded by the son of his predecessor, George W. Bush. Bush came into office with a vision of what he called compassionate conservatism. Like Clinton, he sought compromise between the left and right, producing a platform not too different from that of his predecessor, with exceptions in regard to social and religious issues, challenging abortion policies and later reviving the idea of a federal marriage amendment. In line with his predecessors, Bush would also expand free trade significantly, opening free trade arrangements between the US and several countries in the span of his two terms. The defining characteristic of Bush's presidency, however, as was the theme for every administration of this era, would be his foreign policy focus. It would be during his term that the deadly September 11th attacks would occur, effectively ending the post-Cold War era of good feelings and driving a massive response from Bush in what became the War on Terror a war which Bush's vice president Dick Cheney would have an exceptionally active role in shaping, pushing the administration to invade not only Afghanistan, but to finally pursue regime change in Iraq on the grounds that Iraq had been developing weapons of mass destruction, weapons which in reality never existed. The declaration of a new Bush doctrine had taken the ideology of this era to its natural conclusion, that quote, the survival of liberty in our land depends on the success of liberty in other lands emphasizing an intention to eradicate anti-democratic and anti-liberal ideology across the globe to protect what Bush and many other neoconservatives and neoliberals recognized as the liberal and democratic values of the United States. While Carter and Nixon had been far cries from one another, by the time of the Bushes and Clinton, a largely unified ideology had emerged across both parties, with only slight deviations insofar as social issues were concerned. In later years, this establishment ideology would come to be known particularly among conservatives as the Uniparty, but more commonly would be derided by the respective voters as Republicans in name only for Republicans, or simply not true left-wingers for Democrats. In the years that followed the September 11th attacks, new protocols would be created for holding and interrogating terrorists in government black sites, the Department of Homeland Security was established to enhance security measures nationwide, and the Patriot Act went into effect allowing the government to surveil suspected terrorists and general communications within the United States. Bush's presidency would be rocked by two additional crises, the effects of Hurricane Katrina and a failure of FEMA to appropriately respond to the crisis, as well as the Great Recession. Katrina had represented a very blatant failure of the neoconservative hands-off approach to government, especially in times of crisis. Bush had initially left management of the crisis to state governments not wanting to intervene and upon recognizing the need for federal aid, went to work with an agency that had been terribly mismanaged since its assimilation into the Department of Homeland Security. The Great Recession in turn represented the hazards brought on by reckless deregulation, globalization, and economic speculation, resulting in the worst financial crisis the country had experienced since the Great Depression and one which had affects the world over. In an effort to alleviate the crisis, Bush would authorize the Wall Street bailout of 2008, but solving the crisis would take time, and in that time, power would fall to a new administration, that of Democrat Barack Obama. 
Obama would immediately pass a stimulus package to further aid in alleviating the recession, later providing a bailout for automotive manufacturers at risk of bankruptcy. After a year in office, the economy appeared to be in recovery, however the country was once again suffering from a silent crisis of debt and spending. Bush's war on terror and the response of both administrations to the Great Recession had shot government debt up three quarters of the national GDP. In response to this and the ambitious policy plans of the Obama administration, the debt ceiling would be suspended until the end of Obama's term. Obama would noticeably place a greater focus on domestic issues than his predecessors, but still maintained a focus upon foreign policy, further expanding upon free trade and attempting to pivot away from Middle Eastern affairs to instead focus upon East Asia to challenge what was perceived as the resurgent threats of China and Russia. Since the end of the Cold War and negative publicity received by the CIA for its various covert operations, the United States had sought out new methods of promoting its interests covertly without the use of direct force, and the most effective strategy to emerge in the post-Cold War world was the instigation of color revolutions through independent non-government organizations or NGOs. Through the emergence of mass media and communications, US-funded or supported NGOs would inject themselves into a country of interest, instigate activism and protests, and ultimately, once the time was right, utilize this to pressure the country to adopt change of some sort, from a single policy to an entirely new regime. Color revolutions had already proven successful in Serbia, Georgia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan, which all sought to the installation of pro-Western leaders. With this method seemingly tried and true, it was brought to new areas which the US felt were in need of democratization and liberalization. With Obama eager to pivot away from the highly troubled Middle East and end the war on terror, the idea of stoking pro-democratic change in the region was enticing. The population of the region had already been unsettled by the global effects of the Great Recession and appeared primed to demand change. And so, with the support of the US-funded National Endowment for Democracy, a non-government financial middleman which was founded under Reagan's National Security Decision Directive 77, various NGOs and pro-democracy figures across the Middle East were funded, trained, and coordinated in what ultimately became the Arab Spring, an event which, while motivated by other factors, was absolutely accelerated and reshaped by American desires for change. The results would be far from what the United States desired, however. Civil wars would break out across Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. A massive migrant crisis would result, and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria would emerge as a major terrorist faction which only dragged the US into a deeper Middle Eastern conflict. The overall pivot of the United States from a domestic to foreign policy focus had terrible repercussions both foreign and domestic, and increasingly the public was growing uneasy. The recession would have directly contributed to the emergence of the Occupy movement, whose goal was achieving economic equality and ending corporate influence in politics, soon giving rise to an increasingly anti-capitalist left-wing faction within the Democrat Party. Race-based riots once again became commonplace in an effort by the African-American community to extract more concessions and securities from what was increasingly framed as a systemically racist law enforcement system, this view soon branching out to include various other institutions as well. Additionally, LGBT rights were solidified by the landmark court decision to legalize gay marriage nationwide, or rather deem the banning of same-sex marriage unconstitutional. In contrast, a conservative counterpart to such movements did emerge with what was known as the Tea Party movement, however this was largely engineered by establishment conservatives who want to continue pushing for further decentralization, budget balancing, and vague constitutionalism while avoiding the social issues which were increasingly taking center stage in the minds of many voters, as social policy would reveal the truly fractured nature of the Republican Party at that point. Americans were growing tired of the obligations of a superpower and tired of a government they felt did not put their interests first, a government which failed to put America first. And so in 2016, given the choice between the wife of the president whose administration represented all that Americans came to resent about this era, and a political outsider who promised to break from the establishment and foreign intervention and make America great again, the public voted for the latter. But still, the future would remain unclear. America was in fact preparing for its next great change. But what precisely that would be, and whether it would begin here, is too early to tell.